Hey, what's up guys? It's Clint Coons here. And in this video, I'm going to explain to you the benefits of a living trust, how it works for you today while you're alive and what it can do for you after you've passed. All right, let's get started. Okay. So people ask us all the time, why do I need a living trust? Clint, why would I want to set one of those entities up? Well, here's why you need a living trust because a living trust avoids probate. You've probably heard me talk about this in some of my other videos, but the benefit of having a living trust is that you don't have to go through probate and probate is expensive because every asset you own in your own name, when you pass in order to transfer title. So let's say I have my house, I have my vehicles, right? There, I have my bank account. In order to get all of those assets to your beneficiaries after you've passed away, you have to go through a probate process. And what does that mean? It means this, you're gonna hire an attorney like me to represent. Well, you won't, but your beneficiaries will in order to move these assets over to your intended beneficiaries. Let's say your spouse is a surviving beneficiary. All right, so how does your spouse receive? Same thing, we're gonna to have to start a probate process in order to get these assets cleared. That means your name taken off and your spouse name listed as the sole member. I've seen this happen many, many times in my career where the first spouse passes away, there is never a probate done, the survivor then passes away 10, 15 years later, and this house still remains in both of their names. And then it's supposed to go to the kids. And so it just makes the probate process that more complex and that more expensive. So the purpose of having a living trust, what is it? How does it work for me? Well, what it does for you is it takes all of these assets right here and it puts them into a box. And the thing is, is that when you put them into this box that I've just drawn out here, this is my living trust. What you're doing by putting them into this box, and when I say put them in the box, you're transferring title out of your name. So your house, no longer in your individual name, now it's in the name of your trust. So if my trust was called the, the Black Box Trust, and you can come up with any name you want for your living trust, I would just change the house from Clint Coons to the Black Box Trust. Now the trust owns the assets. So when the trust owns the assets, my assets, then when I pass away, okay, so, so you got the spouse who's passed away here, the trust doesn't die. My name, my name was never on title of these assets because I took them out of my name. So all of these assets that are held in this trust, it's, it, it's, just, it's got a set of instructions with it and it's set to go to operate when you've passed away. All of these assets then will be held for your beneficiary. So there's a set of instructions that come with your living trust that describe what happens when you know both spouses are, are no longer here, okay? what happens to these assets. And so that brings up a good point too about the living trust that people often wonder, well, hey, if I put my assets into the living trust, um, am I gonna lose control? You'll never lose control when you put your assets into a living trust because you and your spouse will be the trustees. So both of you will be over here as the trustees. And I keep saying your spouse, but it could just be you as an individual, if you, because single people create these all the time. So you get them out of your name, you get them in here, you're the trustees, you control all of these assets. In fact, this trust is what we call a revocable trust. What does that mean? That means you can cancel it at any time. You're not locked into using this trust your entire life. If you decide, hey, I don't want this anymore, I've got a divorce, you can cancel it out, not a problem. But the main benefit of having a living trust, the main number one benefit is that avoiding probate. So when you pass away, because the assets are no longer in your name, there's nothing to probate. This is why we recommend this document to people all the time. We're saying, hey, why do you want your family to have to go through the probate process? Why do you want your spouse to have to go through the probate process? Potentially have your assets tied up. So that's a major reason why you're going to set this up. Now, how else does it work? Well, as I stated, it has a set of instructions with it. And the instructions describe how the assets are going to be distributed to your children. And most people, you know, thinking in terms of of distributing the assets, they think of their kids being older and they say, all right, we'll just give them to them outright. Well, maybe that is the right case. Maybe it's not. 
But what happens if your children are younger? Do you want younger children to have assets outright at age 18? I think not because they're prone to make mistakes with those assets. So with a living trust, how it works is that you can specify in there when they're to receive your, these assets and under what circumstances. So for example, if your child was going through a divorce or if your child's in a lawsuit, do you want to give them money? I think not because a creditor or an ex-spouse could potentially get access to those assets. So you could put into the trust, they don't get anything until all those problems have resolved themselves. So we're preserving the state for our loved ones. Now here's something else you may want to consider when it comes to creating your estate plan and setting up a living trust. If your children are young, they're minor children, then the question becomes what happens to them Who's going to raise them and what does that look like? So I was recently speaking with someone. They said, hey, when we pass away, we have three children and right now they're, they're younger. We would like them to be raised by uh, some good friends of ours who live in this house. Okay, these two people here and they have two kids of their own. Okay, great. So when you're gone, if both of you were to pass away, you and your spouse, you want your three minor children to be raised by these two individuals here that have two kids. They said, that's exactly what we want. All right, great. What size of house do they have? And they said, why does that matter? I said, just, do you know? They said, oh yeah, they have a three, two, okay? So three bedroom, two bath house. And I said, and you want them to take all three of these kids and put five kids and two adults into a three by two. How do you think that's gonna work out at the end of the day? He said, oh, wow, that's interesting. And then, you know, what about education? Do you still, do you want them to go into that school district? You want to keep them in the private school if they're currently in private school? What about family vacations now? Maybe they're accustomed to going on family vacations to Hawaii, but now they have three other people to take with them. So that stops. So those are things that you can incorporate into a trust. And in this example, what we did is we said, this couple with those kids, they can move in to the this couple's house that they could bring their whole family move into here because this was a large house this is a 7,000 square foot home here right six bedrooms right eight baths they can move into that house there raise the kids until everyone's out of college and at that point in time the house is still owned by the trust allowing them to live there rent free so there's kind of an incentive they get to keep their house but then when the kids are all grown up and they're out of college, that is your children, then at that point in time, they would move out and that becomes an asset for your kids. So these are things that a lot of times people don't think about when they're putting together an estate plan, all the minor details that can, that can come up. And if let's say you have a bunch of rental real estate, for example, right? I was dealing with someone the other day on this, this particular issue as well. They have a bunch of rental real estate. I said, okay, great. Who's going to run it? Who's going to manage it? And they're like, well, our successor trustee. Okay, your successor trustee. Let, let, let's talk about this person you named as your successor trustee. So when you're no longer here, the way living trust works is that when you've passed away and your spouse has passed away, if you're married, if it's a joint trust, then you nominate someone to step in to control all the assets for your beneficiaries. Now, I have other videos talking about this as well. It's important you watch those because I talk about not naming your kids as successor trustees of your living trust if you don't want them to have the assets outright, because it's kind of like this, you know, um, here, I'm gonna leave my assets in trust for my kids. And uh, they can only take out 10% a year for the next 10 years out of the trust. And they're gonna be the trustees. I've seen so many people make that mistake. And I said, well, that's kind of like saying this to the fat kid. Hey, you like, hey, fat kid, you like cookies, right? So here's a cookie jar. You get one cookie a year for the next 10 years. And we're not coming back to check on you, but don't put your hand in the cookie jar more than one time a year. What is a kid gonna do, right? If he likes cookies, the kid's gonna reach in there and eat all the cookies right away. So you have to be careful. That's why you consider naming people to be your successor trustees right? That will control these assets for them and there's no conflict there. But with a living trust, you can get more granular and you have to think about these issues. So if you have rental real estate, for instance, and you've named a successor trustee, my question to you is, does that successor trustee know anything about rental real estate? Because if you're trying to build a legacy of wealth, or maybe it's a business that you own, whatever it is, the person that you put in charge of your trust for the benefit of your kids, you want them to maximize that value. You want to make sure that your kids get what they, that you've built up or whatever that means to you or that income stream. You don't want someone to mismanage it. And 
successor trustees can mismanage the assets, not intentionally, but because they don't have the skill set. So what I like to explain to people when you're setting up a living trust, hey, maybe you have a couple of successor trustees. So I have one trustee here to manage the house and the cars and the cash, but then I bring in this other trustee over here and this guy here, he's managing the real estate because he has a real estate background. He understands it. So this person manages the real estate. This successor trustee manages everything else. This is just a, an idea of what you can do and what you should be thinking about when you're creating a estate plan. This idea of I'll just leave it in a will and it'll just hopefully work out in the wash. I've seen them, so many mistakes happen where families have been destroyed over not having a well-drafted estate plan. The kids burn up all the money right away. And that legacy that you're hoping that it would be there disappears. All right, so that's what a living trust does while, after you've passed away. But here's something that's often missed. A living trust actually protects you while you're alive. Now, how does a living trust protect you while you're alive? Well, it's the fact that you've taken these assets out of your name and I've got them now in this box over here. Should I become incapacitated, right? So let's say I'm in a hospital, I'm incapacitated right now. I'm sitting in that hospital bed. I got this oxygen tank pumping here, keeping me going. And so what happens to my bank accounts, my real estate, my personal residence and my vehicles and everything that I've accumulated? Well, if it's inside of the trust, then my successor trustee has complete control. So they, my successor trustee can work with my bank. They can work with my retirement account administrator. They can work with my property managers and they can ensure that things keep working for my behalf, right? Because what you, I doubt you would like is let's say you're in a coma for six months because you're in a hit and run and uh, you're the one that got hit, not the one that ran. And so you come out of it only to find that your house has been sold, your accounts have been liquidated, and your kids are now living in the Bahamas, right? You wouldn't want that, but it could happen. If you name someone a financial power of attorney, you gave them power of attorney over you, so that if you're ever in a, uh, you're ever incapacitated, they can make all your financial decisions. They can make financial decisions that you may not agree with. They could sell your assets, do things with those funds, that you sit back, you wake up and go, what happened to my real estate? What happened to my brokerage account? Well, we thought it was best if we liquidated it because we didn't know if you were going to come out of this. With a living trust, it protects you while you're alive by conserving your assets, making sure that they stay the way they are for your benefit. No one else other than your spouse or you will benefit from those assets while you're alive. I think that's really important. That gives us a, a sense of peace of mind knowing that we've put together a state plan that not only takes care of the people that we want to take care of after we've passed away, the people that we love, but also if something should happen to me and I'm not gone, I want to make sure that my assets are effectively managed. A well-drafted trust will do that for you. And so that's why when you come to thinking about setting up a state plan, I would highly encourage you to create a living trust. Now, if you want to know more about how a living trust works, we teach a tax and asset protection event Every other Saturday, I've got a link in the description below. You can register for it. It's completely free. Not only do we teach you about limited liability companies and land trusts and how they work for your real estate, but my partner, Toby Mathis, when he blows you away and all the tax savings that can come from running a business and owning real estate, he'll also teach you in depth how to create a legacy plan. Thanks, guys.